We have two scripture readings to look at today, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. The one from the New is from Luke chapter 1, starting to read at verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby wept in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. The second passage is from Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. If I can find it, here it is. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Father, bless this word to our hearts today. Help us to understand um, how we can apply it to our lives today and to some very difficult and tricky situations in our lives today and in society today. Father, open up our understanding. Give us ears to hear what you'd have to say to us. Give us open hearts and open minds. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time as yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple years ago, I shared three sermons with you on difficult and sometimes controversial topics in our society. Topics that scripture has things to say on and that we as a church need to think about and deal with. Someone half-jokingly called this sermon series, Sermons That Could Get Jeff in Trouble. Well, this morning I want to add a fourth <laughs> to that series by talking about a topic that has been on my heart for quite a while now. It's a topic that has been in the news lately in both the United States and Canada. It's a topic that has been the subject of landmark court cases, uh, Roe versus Wade in 1973 in the US, and the Morgenthaler case before the Supreme Court of Canada in 1988. It's a topic that has affected the lives of millions of people in the US and Canada in the past 50 years, and it's a topic about which I think scripture has a lot to say. And the topic is abortion. This morning, I want to look at the topic of abortion from three different angles. First, from the standpoint of politics. Second, from science. And third, from scripture. Now, I, don't, we, I know we don't normally discuss politics from the pulpit, but I believe it is important to discuss how we as a nation in Canada got to where we are in terms of legisl legislation concerning abortion. Because it's my firm belief that most Canadians really don't know how we got to where we are and where we as a nation stand in comparison to the rest of the world. The reality in Canada right now is that we have no law governing abortion. None. In theory, abortion can be done right up until birth can be done after eight months and 30 days of pregnancy. Now, the argument will be made that this rarely happens, but it does happen. In 2017, 700 abortions were performed in Canada in hospitals after 21 weeks. Now, it's important to note in hospitals because only one third of abortions in Canada are performed in hospitals. Two-thirds of abortions in Canada are performed in clinics. And these clinics are not required to provide any kind of statistics beyond the number of abortions performed. 
They're not required to report the date, the stage of pregnancy, the age of the mother, nothing. So it is very difficult in Canada to arrive at any objective statistics about the state of abortion in Canada. But if we were to extrapolate the hospital figures, we could guess that there are approximately 2,000 abortions performed every year at 21 weeks of pregnancy or later. A stage where, with modern medical science, a fetus could survive outside the womb. So we could have a situation where in the same hospital, in one room, doctors and nurses are working tirelessly to save the life of a baby born prematurely at 22 weeks, while in the, in the next room, an abortionist can be terminating the life of a 22-week-old fetus. Now, some may argue that this is a rare situation, and that's why we don't need a law. But laws are passed precisely for rare situations. Murder is rare. Armed assault, in Canada at least, is rare. Tax fraud is rare. And yet we still have laws against these because each has a vulnerable victim that society must protect. And I would argue that there is no more vulnerable in society than a pre-born baby. Now, abortion was illegal in Canada until 1969 when Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre, prime minister at the time, oversaw the passing of new laws legalizing abortion under strict conditions. And over the following 20 years, cases were brought before the courts, primarily by Montreal abortionist Henry Morgenthaler, that attempted to loosen the conditions and restrictions that were written into our laws. And finally, in 1988, a landmark case went before our Supreme Court, and the abortion law as it existed at that time was struck down as unconstitutional. And here is where the myth of abortion law in Canada began to take root. Because of this court decision, it is believed by many that the right to an abortion at any time for any reason is written into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is not true. Because of this court decision, it is believed by many that the Supreme Court of Canada has determined that abortion must be legal in Canada at any time and for any reason. This also is not true. Here's what the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court struck down the abortion law as it existed at that time as unconstitutional. The Supreme Court decision specifically stated that the Parliament, the Government of Canada, does have a vested interest in protecting the rights of the fetus, but that those rights in the view of the court needed to be measured against other rights in society. And so in 1988 and 1989, the Conservative Government of Brian Mulroney took the ball that the Supreme Court tossed back into their court and went about attempting to craft an abortion law that would abide with the Supreme Court decision. And this created months of debate and discussion around the cabinet table as ministers worked to craft a new law. And they knew, they knew that anything they come up with would, would fail to please everybody. But they hoped to come up with a law that, that would find an acceptable middle ground. And when they finally brought the law to Parliament, it passed with Conservatives voted in favour, along with a few Liberals, in what was a free vote. And as is parliamentary tradition, votes on subject of this nature are not dictated by party lines. MPs are free to vote according to their conscience. Now, as with all laws in Canada, this bill was sent to the Senate for approval. Now, our Senate in Canada, unlike the one in the States, is not elected by we, the voters. It is a group of 100 unelected people appointed by prime ministers over the years. And they're given the task of, of reviewing legislation, giving proposed laws, what's known as a sober second look, and make possible recommendations for changes. And then they, they toss those recommendations back to the House of Commons for final approval or rejection. 
At that point in 1989, it had been over 30 years since the Senate had voted down a piece of legislation in its entirety, requiring the House of Commons to go back to the drawing board and start over again. 30 years. And for most Canadians at the time, this is how they felt it should have been. While an unelected Senate could prove useful in you know, reviewing laws and making suggestions, they were still unelected. Voting down a piece of legislation was rightfully seen as going against the will of the people and their elected representatives in the House of Commons. So the time came for the Senate to vote on this abortion le legislation. And not all 100 senators were present in the House, and which is often the case, but there was a quorum. There was enough there to have a vote. I believe there was 86 out of the 100 there. And when the votes were counted, it was a tie. Now, under the rules of the Senate, a tie vote means that the bill is defeated. So the unelected Senate sent the abortion bill back to the House of Commons for them to start all over again, to begin the process of months of agonizing debate all over again. For the first time in over 30 years, an unelected Senate voted down a bill passed by the elected House of Commons, voted it down by one vote. So the Maoruni government, having almost torn themselves apart, coming up with this abortion bill was in no mood to go through the process again. And they decided not to accept the Supreme Court's offer to come up with another bill. And for the last 30 years, every Canadian government has taken the same position. There's a myth today that the abortion debate in Canada is a settled issue. The impression is given that a great national debate was had and that what we have now is the will of the majority of Canadians as a result of this great national debate. This is not true. We have no abortion law in Canada today, not because of some great national discussion, consensus agreed upon by the majority of Canadians. No, we have no abortion law in Canada today because of a fluke of parliamentary procedure. We have no abortion law in Canada today because one senator in 1989 decided not to show up for work that day. And that is why so many people in Canada feel that the issue of abortion is not a settled issue, that it is something that still requires a free and open national debate. Because many people in Canada do not realize that we have no abortion law. Many people do not realize how it came to be that we have no abortion law. And many people do not realize where that places us in terms of other countries in the world. There are only two other countries in the world besides Canada that have no abortion law, China and North Korea. Two countries that are not very high on the list of how they treat human rights, of how they treat life in general is valuable. Two countries that I'm sure most Canadians would not want mentioned in the same sentence as ours when it came to issues of human rights and moral law. And although there has been a lot of commotion recently in the States, um, that, that are, there are certain states in the U.S. putting restrictions on abortion, the truth is that almost every country in the world places some restrictions on abortion. They do not allow for abortion at any time for any reason, a concept that was a couple of years ago put before the House of Commons and received a standing ovation from all parties except the Conservatives. Many of these countries have government systems highly respected by Canadians, and yet they have abortion laws. In Germany, abortions are allowed only up to 12 weeks and only after counseling has been given and there's a three-day waiting period. In Sweden, abortions are allowed unlimited, uh, for any reason up to 18 weeks, but not after that unless special permission is given. 
In Denmark, abortion on demand is allowed up to 12 weeks. Afterwards, it's only if the life of, and health of the woman is in danger. Norway's abortion law says abortion on demand is okay up to 12 weeks, by special application up to 18 weeks, and not at all after viability, after the fetus can live outside the womb. In the Netherlands, it's up to 21 weeks, but that includes a five-day waiting period, and it must be in a hospital. In France, it's 12 weeks, unlimited abortion up to 12 weeks, but it's only after two doctors agree that the health of the woman is in grave danger or that the fetus has an incurable disease. Canada's lack of an abortion law is unique in the Western civilized world, and it does not reflect the will of the majority of Canadians. But because of the myths surrounding how we got to where we are, we as a society are not free to have the great national discussion that this issue deserves. Now, science. I grew up in Montreal and I remember as a teen 40 years ago, listening to a radio call-in show where abortion was being discussed and one lady phoned in and she was completely dismissive of any pro-life stance and argued over and over again that what was being aborted was nothing but a bunch of cells. And I remember even then shaking my head at how disingenuous that argument was. I don't think I knew back then what the word disingenuous meant, but <laughs> it just wasn't true. And as time passed, medical technology has shown us that what is in the womb of a mother is more than just a bunch of cells. And yet I have been shocked and surprised to hear people even today, 40 years later, still using that argument. It seems that if people say something often enough and loud enough, there are people who will start to believe it, even if it contradicts the science, contradicts the evidence. So the question I have is, when a, an abortion takes place, what is being aborted? From 1935 to 1972, there was a weekly news magazine published in the US called Life Magazine. It covered many of the serious and controversial issues of the day, and yet also covered celebrity culture and lighter human interest stories. And what set Life magazine apart from its competitors were its pictures. Life hired the best photographers in the world and printed pictures that were eye-opening and worldview changing. Many of the most famous photographs of the 20th century first appeared in Life magazine. I like going to flea markets, antique bookstores, antique stores looking for books or other interesting things. And I like looking for old editions of Life magazine. I, I think I, over the years I picked up a dozen or 15 or so. I picked one up years ago that was dated April 30th, 1965. And the front cover pictured a photograph taken by Swedish photographer Leonard Nilsson. And Nilsson had embarked on a seven year project to document in photos the prenatal development of human beings. And the results of his efforts were published in this 1965 issue of Life. Now this was 1965. This was before court decisions had brought about huge debates on abortion. Nilsson was not publishing these pictures for any political or ideological reason. In fact, Nilsson died four years ago and to his dying day, he never made any pronouncement on where he stood on the abortion question. He took these pictures and published them purely in the interest of science, purely to document the truth about how we as humans develop in the womb. I wanna show you some of these pictures that Leonard Nilsson published in Life magazine in 1965. Pictures that will, from a purely scientific standpoint, show us just what is being aborted, whether it is a clump of cells or something more. These pictures here are of an embryo at six and a half weeks. This is the stage where 39% of abortions in Canada take place. We can see a clearly defined head with a developing eye prominent in the photo. 
fingers can be seen having developed to the first joint. At this stage, the embryo has all the internal organs of an adult in various stages of development. It has a little mouth with lips and the early evidence of a tongue. Its sex and reproductive organs have begun to develop. When an abortion happens at six and a half weeks, this is what is being aborted. Life published Nilsson's pictures of a fetus at 11 weeks with the heading, all of the body systems formed and at work. This would include the nervous system, which would enable pain to be felt. It's at this stage between nine and 12 weeks that 44% of abortions in Canada are performed. We can see in the picture that arms and legs have clearly developed. The beginnings of an ear appears at the side of the head. The rib cage is also noticeable. It is at this stage that bones begin to develop, rep replacing the cartilage that was present in the earlier stages of development. When an abortion happens at 11 weeks, this is what is being aborted. This picture is at 16 weeks development, just under four months. 9% of abortions in Canada take place between 13 and 16 weeks. The text in Life magazine next to this picture states, the body has filled out fantastically, quite recognizable now as a human baby. When an abortion happens at 16 weeks, this is what is being aborted. Finally, we have Nielsen's pictures of a fetus at 18 weeks and 28 weeks. Four and a half percent of abortions in Canada take place between 17 and 21 weeks and 3.3% take place after. I took a university course at um, Ontario Tech University in Oshawa a couple years ago. And um, I had a few courses I wanted to take, but the only one available to me was developmental psychology, which I wasn't terribly excited about, but I thought, hey, this will be interesting. And it focused on child development and primarily in the first five years of life. But we did a section on brain development and in, dis in discussing prenatal development, our professor said something that just blew me away. She said that at 18 weeks development, the fetus has all the brain cells it will ever have in its life. Now, they aren't in order yet. That happens after birth and in early life development. But all the raw brain material that a human being needs for life is present in an 18-week-old fetus. The fetus in this picture has all the raw brain material that it will ever have and need for life. The picture at 18 weeks shows the presence of fingernails. It shows the pre-born baby beginning to develop the sucking action that it will need to feed. The magazine text next to the photo says, the 18-week-old fetus is active and energetic and does a lot of muscle flexing. It can make an impressively hard fist, and the punches and kicks are plainly felt by the mother. It can go through the motions of crying, too. It is equipped with a complete set of vocal cords, but without air, it cannot make a sound. When an abortion happens at 18 weeks, this is what is being aborted. In 1965, before the fetus became a political football, Society was not afraid to look at pictures like these and discuss the truth of science. In fact, these pictures were developed and published to demonstrate the wonders of human development. With the exception of the Life magazine documenting the assassination of John F. Kennedy, this issue of Life magazine was the best-selling issue in life's history. Many people today talk about the importance of choice in this issue of abortion. But not many talk about the notion of informed choice. In order for choice to truly be a choice, there needs to be alternatives. There needs to be choices to choose from. And in order to make a truly informed choice, information about all the alternatives must be available and considered. And my concern about abortion is that so many people 
are making life-changing decisions without really having the information needed to make an informed choice. Information like what we've just seen. Information from the truth of science. And they are making life-changing decisions without realizing that there are, there are alternatives. Many U.S. states have laws requiring an informed choice. They require that the patient view an ultrasound of their baby in the womb. They require that once the initial visit is made to an abortion clinic, that a 24-hour waiting period is required before an abortion is done. They require a woman to go home for a day and think about it and make an informed choice based on the information she has received. And unfortunately, many people in the pro-choice camp fight against laws like this because they know that in the vast majority of cases, an informed choice will mean the choice not to have an abortion. They know that abortion is often done in a crisis, often done in a panic, and that information and time to think about it will often cause the mother to change her mind. Abortion is something that most mothers are rushed into, coerced into by family, boyfriends, husbands, friends, without really considering the alternatives. Over my two decades working with teenagers, I honestly haven't had too many young ladies come to me worried that they were pregnant, but I have had a few. And quite honestly, not a single one of them mentioned abortion as an option right off the bat. It's not a natural first thought. It is something that life situations force a person into. It is something that the coercion of others pushes a person into. And if there's anything that we as a church can do to minister to women facing an unplanned pregnancy, that is something that we can do. Help them practically with the life situations that make them feel that abortion is their only option. Give them a safe space away from pressure and coercion so that they can have time to breathe and think, time to investigate the truth. For I believe that with the evidence and true information available and with proper support offered, most women will choose life. We've looked at politics, we've looked at science, and now scripture. Psalm, 31, Psalm 131 is one of the most powerful passages talking about God's intention for human life. And how this intention reaches back even beyond the womb to the beginning of time. The psalmist writes this prayer to God. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Here the psalmist acknowledges God as the creator of all that he is as a human. God is acknowledged as the creator of human life. Anything that destroys human life is, de is denying the value of God as creator. It is essentially putting itself in the place of God. Only God has the right to change what he has created. In abortion, we take that right away from him. It says he knit us together in our mother's womb. This speaks to God's creative function, which we've seen in these amazing Life magazine pictures. The process of who we become, of who God has planned for us to be, begins not only after we're born. It already began in the womb. And I have always loved the psalmist's use of the word knit. Knit me together in my mother's womb. Have you ever received a knitted sweater from grandma? Now, grandma could have gone to Walmart and spent half an hour looking through the racks of sweaters that all look somewhat alike until, until she found just the right one for you. And that would have been a very nice and thoughtful gift. But instead, grandma knit you a sweater. She sat down and thought about you and who you are and what you look like, and what looks good on you, and imagined in her mind that perfect sweater 
the perfect sweater that would just look right on you. And then she set about knitting it for you. And she sat for hours in her rocking chair, rocking back and forth, knitting needles in arthritic hands. And with a speed of de and dexterity that only years of practice could deliver, she knit you a sweater. And with every knit one, purl two, she is thinking of you, of how much she loves you, of how wonderful you will look in this knitted sweater. God knit you together in your mother's womb. And he did it with all the love and care that his infinite being could muster. And as he knit, you were constantly on his mind. Who you would become, what you would look like, what you would do in this life. You were not simply picked off the rack. You are unique. You are valuable. God spent an eternity past deciding how to create you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The human being is an incredible and complex creation. The development in the womb is incredible and complex. And that development is under the constant watchful eye of our loving Heavenly Father. There is not a stage in our life where he is not watching, where he is not caring for us, where he is not accomplishing his creative purposes. And that includes in the womb. In fact, it includes before the womb. Psalm 139 says that God's eyes saw our unformed body. Some people in the abortion debate will focus on the stages of fetal development. They will encourage laws to be passed to ban abortion after a fetus, a fetus is viable outside the, room, the womb, usually like 20, 22 weeks. Others will encourage fetal pain or fetal heartbeat laws that will ban abortion once the nervous system is developed and pain can be, can be felt around 11 weeks. Or once a fetal heartbeat can be heard, usually around eight weeks. These are all good in saving some lives, and they are better than no law at all. But in God's eyes, our development began before even egg met sperm. God saw us before we were even formed. The days of our lives were already known to God, even before we physically came into being. And that is because we are more than just a physical being. We are soul. We are spirit. We are not a physical body that contains a soul, but rather we are a soul wrapped in a physical body. God's plan for our lives predates our physical conception, but it is, it is at that physical conception that the plan is put into place. Who we really are, soul and spirit, is created and placed within the physical. And in doing so, God puts into motion plans for our lives that are unique and ordained by him. Abortion cuts short those plans. Heaven will be filled with the souls of millions of aborted babies. But they will be there too soon. God had other plans. And humans in their free will, in their ability to choose, cut those plans short. And God weeps. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 is an example of a number of places in scripture where God spells out the uniqueness of a particular human being. And though the words are spoken particularly to one person, Jeremiah in this case, I believe they demonstrate the nature of God towards all of his human creation. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Again, the point is driven home. God not only knew us in the womb, he knew us before the womb and set us apart. There are things in this world that only you can accomplish for God's honor. There are situations in this world that God has placed you in uniquely to make a difference. Others might be able to do the job okay, but no one can do it as well as you and as exact as you can. And abortion removes from the world the lives of millions 
who could have made a difference. The story is told of a teacher who was running a class debate on abortion. She put forth a real life scenario of a single mother's situation and asked the class to decide if she should have an abortion or not. The mother's situation was one of great poverty. Many other factors were described that would make life extremely difficult for mother and child. The odds were enormously stacked against this child. And when the vote was taken, the class overwhelmingly voted that the mother should have an abortion. And the teacher then announced to the class, congratulations, you've just aborted Beethoven. We see things in life from this side of the glass, and it's not a very clear glass. We see obstacles and difficulties. We see trials and stumbling blocks, and these hurdles seem insurmountable. And with that limited information, and with a sense of panic looking through a glass darkly, we make a choice based on only what we can see. But God sees so much more. He sees things clearly. He sees a life that can overcome the odds and make a difference in this world. He sees a life that can honor him and bless humanity. He sees a life that he created and knows intimately, both in the womb and before the womb. He has a plan for that life from eternity past, and he wants to carry it out. Every life has value to God, after birth, in the womb, and even before the womb. And to drive home that point, Scripture tells us of how God used the fetus to do something incredibly important. I went to a pro-life rally on Parliament Hill in Ottawa in 1990 when the abortion debate around that Supreme Court decision was really heated. And I had the privilege of hearing Mother Teresa speak there. She was a nun who was a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, who worked in Calcutta, India, amongst the poorest of the poor. And her ministry was one that valued all human life. And as such, she had an interest, a passionate interest in the issue of abortion. It was listening to her in Ottawa that day that I heard an angle to a very familiar Bible story that I had never really thought of before. So we read earlier from Luke chapter 1, where Mary, pregnant with Jesus, but having told no one but Joseph about the situation, went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now Elizabeth had received a special visit from an angel as well, and she was pregnant with a baby who would become John the Baptist, the one whose ministry would prepare the way for Jesus. She was a few months further along in her pregnancy than Mary was. Now, Elizabeth didn't know about Mary being pregnant, but as soon as Mary came to Elizabeth and spoke a word of greeting, the baby in Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy. The world didn't know yet about this special baby that Mary was carrying, but God allowed this fetus to know and respond with unmistakable joy. We think of the Christmas story and usually understand that it was the angels appearing before the shepherds that first announced the coming of the Christ child. And that pronouncement was significant. But the first declaration of the presence of the Christ child, the presence of the Son of God on earth, was given by a fetus. God chose a fetus to be the first to announce the coming birth of Jesus. Every life has value and a unique purpose in God's creative plan. After birth, in the womb, and even before the womb. But we live in a fallen world. And every day we humans make choices that go against God's purposes, that are contrary to his creative plan. And there are people in our sphere of influence that may have had abortions or are in situations where they are facing the choice to have an abortion. What should we as a church be doing as God's hands and feet here on earth? 
Well, first, I think the church needs to be unafraid in teaching and modeling a holistic, godly view of sex. It's a topic that's rarely talked about on Sunday morning. It's usually covered once a year in a youth group talk that everyone is uncomfortable with. But we need to be able to get across to society the fact that sex is God's creation. It was his idea. And like all of his ideas, it works best within the framework, within the boundaries that he provides for those ideas. And in this case, the framework for, for sex is within the context that Jesus taught. A marriage between a man and a woman, where they leave their families and cleave to each other as one flesh. People aren't perfect. And since marriages made up of two are made up of two people, they aren't perfect either. But the idea of marriage as set up by God was meant to be perfect. It is a gift he has given us where sex can be freely enjoyed and where the proper support systems for raising children can be put in place. I said before that I haven't had many young women come to me in my ministry concerned that they were pregnant, but, but having ministered amongst youth and young adults for over 20 years, I've seen a number of young women grow up and watch them in, enter into a relationship that they thought was forever love, that they thought was stable, and then watch them end up in young adulthood as single mothers after the guy is bailed, having to struggle against the odds to provide for their child, struggle to go back to school and get jobs that will sustain them as a family. Abortion is more likely to exist where hopelessness sees no other alternative. And the church needs to work to head off hopelessness before it develops by teaching and modeling healthy, godly perspectives on sex and marriage. Second, the church needs to be a safe place where people can come without fear of being shamed. Another thing my prof um, brought up in a discussion in our developmental psychology class was the difference between guilt and shame which is a dichotomy I've been thinking a lot about lately. And if, even if a secular psychologist thinks it's important to know, then I think it's important to consider it from a spiritual standpoint as well. Guilt and shame start from the same place. They start with a behavior or attitude that we know to be wrong, either because of the consequences, because of our conscience, or because of our knowledge of God and his word. It's what we do with that feeling that makes the difference. Guilt makes us feel badly for what we've done, but then it prompts us to reach out for forgiveness, to say, I'm sorry to the person we've wronged, whether that be another human or God. The scripture talks about godly guilt that leads to repentance, that leads to a turning away from the sin that caused the guilt in the first place and leads us to run to God for forgiveness and strength to stay away from that sinful behavior or attitude. Now, shame also makes us feel badly for what we've done. But shame is guilt turned inward. Instead of reaching out for forgiveness, we instead turn within ourselves and we, we beat ourselves up and we, we tell ourselves what, what horrible people we are and we convince ourselves that we are of no worth and no value. Shame causes us to run away from people to run away from God. Shame creates a prison where we begin to see our value as zero or even less than zero. People facing an unplanned pregnancy for the most part expect to receive shame from the church. And part of that assumption is our fault. We have at times in our history offered shame instead of grace. But part of that reasoning is also the work of the enemy. Convincing people that the guilt that they are feeling, which is a gift from God and it's meant to lead us to mercy, that gift they're feeling is actually shame instead, which causes people to run from God and to avoid the church at all costs. The church should never be a place of shame. We need to guard against any human tendency to express shame. And the church also needs to help people see the difference between guilt and shame. 
to help people take ownership of their sinful actions and attitudes and help them come to a place of finding forgiveness, finding grace, finding mercy. Thirdly, the church needs to be the support system that is lacking in many who seek abortions. An unplanned pregnancy creates incredible hurdles and obstacles in life that many just can't see their way over. The church needs to be a place that will help with the practical hurdles and obstacles. A place where friends can be found. A place where adoptive grandparents can be found. People who can fill in the gaps that the woman is missing in her family life. A place where practical resources can be put at the individual's disposal. A place that can direct the woman to specialized ministries that can help with counseling and support and alternatives such as adoption. Fourthly, the church needs to teach men and boys how to be the man God created them to be. And that includes never putting a woman in a situation where an abortion might have to be considered, and that if he does, to live up to his responsibilities and not walk out. Over my years again in youth and young adult ministry, I've seen a number of young women who are now single mothers, and they had a boyfriend who got them pregnant. And yet as I would watch the situation over time, I could see the boyfriend becoming more and more distant and eventually just bailing and leaving. There was a lack of commitment on the boyfriend's part, primarily because there was no lifelong commitment of marriage in the first place. And I could see the young woman's frustration that the boyfriend wouldn't get off his video game, wouldn't stop going out with his friends all the time, wasn't holding down a steady job. The young man did something years ago that put him in a situation of possibly becoming a parent. But when he did become a parent, he did next to nothing to take care of his responsibilities. And now he's left a single mother behind that has to struggle to get by. And he's left a little boy or girl who will see daddy as a visitor rather than a daily part of their life. Men sometimes like to point to the Bible passages that build them up as being in a place of superiority to their wives and women in general. But God also calls men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And what did Christ do for the church? He died for it. He gave all he had for her. The church needs to teach men to stop being takers and to start being givers. To give all they have to create the support system, the family that is needed to raise a child in order to fulfill that child's godly purpose in life. And finally, the church needs to be a place where those who have lived through an abortion can find grace, forgiveness, and love. People who advocate for abortion sell it as a procedure that will put the past behind you and give you a fresh start. But the reality for many women is that their abortion was just the beginning of a whole new agony. Of a past that continually haunts. Of constant struggle with thoughts of what might have been. And no matter how many times they are told that their decision was the right one, there's something deep inside of them that tells them otherwise. And those feelings demand to be dealt with. There are three options to dealing with it. Bury the pain, even though it will never be completely buried deep enough to go away. Run away in shame. Or number three, find mercy grace, forgiveness, and healing. Sometimes I think we sell God's grace short. Even those of us who are Christians can sometimes feel there are, there are some sins that are just too big to be forgiven. But the truth is that God's grace is amazing. It is limitless. It is endless, and it is freely given. The church needs to walk with those who struggle with their past choices. Walk with them and show them grace. Walk with them until they find God's incredible grace 
that will bind the wounds and bring the healing that was once thought impossible. As much as some people would like it to, abortion is an issue that is not going to go away anytime soon. And we as the church have a role to play in this issue. I believe we do have a role to play in the political realm, working to change laws that will protect the vulnerable, both mother and child, from the pain caused by abortion. But more than changing laws, we need to work to change hearts. And we do that by speaking truth. The truth that science demonstrates, showing us what the real consequences are of the choice to abort. And the truth that scripture reveals, the truth that all the days of our lives are ordained by God, that he knit us together in the womb and knows us intimately even before the womb, that all life has meaning and purpose, and that any life cut short destroys God's plans for that life to make a difference in this world. And we work to change hearts by reaching out to those who face abortion, offering alternatives, offering support in the midst of crisis, exhibiting not shame, but a love and a grace that helps people understand that God's conviction is a call to reach out for forgiveness, to reach out for grace, to reach out for healing, whether before an abortion or years after one. All life has value in God's eyes. May we who follow the Lord reflect that godly value for life, for those already born and in need of God's help and grace, and for those yet to be born, yet who have been known and loved by God even before they were formed.